Hello, it's good to be with you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to bring the Word of God uh, to you. And I want to turn today to Joshua, please, in chapter number 9. Joshua in chapter number uh, 9. And we're going to look at the first 27 uh, verses of Joshua in chapter number 9. So we'll just read these verses together before we get into it. Joshua chapter 9. And it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys, and in all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite and the Perizzite, the Hivazite and the Jebusite heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wilily and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles old and rent and bound up and old shoes and clouted upon their feet and old garments upon them and all the bread of their provision was dry and mouldy. And they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country, now therefore make ye a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure ye dwell among us. And how shall we make an, a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are you? And from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come, because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sion king of Heshbon, and to Og king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Where for our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants. Now, therefore now, make ye a league with us. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry and it is mouldy. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent. And these are garments and their shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. And it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbours and that they dwelt among them. And the children of Israel journeyed and came unto their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon and Chephra and Beeroth and Kirjath Jerim. And the children of Israel smote them not, because the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation murmured against the princes. But all the princes said unto all the congregation, We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will even let them live, lest wrath be upon us, because of the oath which we swear unto them. And the princes said unto them, Let them live, but let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water unto all the congregation, as the princes had promised them. And Joshua called for them, and he spake unto them, saying, Wherefore have you beguiled us, saying, We are from uh, very far from you, when you dwell among us? Now therefore ye are cursed, and there shall none of you be freed from being bondmen, and hewers of wood, and drawers of water for the house of my God. And they answered Joshua and said, Because it was certainly told thy servants how that the Lord thy God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. Therefore we were sore afraid of our lives because of you and have done this thing. And now behold, we are in thine hand, as it seemeth good and right unto thee to do unto us, do. And so did he unto them and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel, yet they slew them not. And Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord, even unto this day, in the place which he should choose. Amen. And we know that God always blesses his uh, word when we read it together. Now we want to look at this occasion, this sorry time this mistake that Joshua and the children, the princes of the children of Israel 
made on this occasion. They were taken in by deceit. They were deceived. And they were deceived by a people that they ought to destroy. A people that God had told them wasn't to be spared and was to be driven out of the land. And as a result of being taken in by that deceit, there were consequences for the children of Israel and also for the Gibeonites. And what was that deceit? Well, we read it. It was very clever, wasn't it? It was one of those uh, ruses, one of those deceits that was actually so simple and probably worked well because it was so simple. Here were the Gibeonites and they heard that the children of Israel were coming and they knew why they were coming. They say that. They had heard what the Lord God had done for the people in bringing them out of Egypt and had given them the land, the land that they dwelled in. And they had heard of what had happened at Jericho and Ai and they knew that they were next. And so they developed this plan that what they would do was they would present themselves as being foreigners in the land people who had travelled from out with the land into the land to come and meet the children of Israel and to make a covenant with them and to present themselves as being no threat and no danger and not the people that Joshua and the children of Israel were looking for to drive out of the land. And so they thought, well, when they go to meet Joshua, how are they going to be convincing how are they going to convince Joshua and the children of Israel that they're not their neighbours? And so they come up with this very simple plan. They gather together old sacks and old clothes and old wine bottles and old shoes and mouldy bread. And they dress themselves up in a way that appears as if they have travelled a long distance. To all intents and purposes... They were travellers who had come a long way and they gave the appearance of being people who had come on a long journey. Quite the opposite appearance of people who lived literally just down the road. And when they met Joshua and the children of Israel, they gave their story and they backed it up with this deceit and this plan that they had and Joshua and the children of Israel fell for it. Now there's an example of that as well in more modern times. During the Second World War, when the British and the Allies were planning the invasion of Sicily, they wanted to deceive the Germans. They wanted to trick them. They wanted to make the Germans think that it wasn't Sicily they were going to invade, but rather Greece. And by doing that, having the Germans keep lots of their army in Greece rather than transfer them for the defence of Sicily. And so they decided that what they would do was they would create a fictitious character. And that character would be somebody of credibility and he would be carrying plans for the invasion of Greece. And well, they took the body, the body of a man just an unknown man who had died in London and they dressed him up as a fictitious person, Major William Martin of the Royal Marines and they created a whole persona around this person. They gave him a wallet with a, a photograph of him and his sweetheart and they created a whole backstory for this person, Major William Martin, who never existed. But they gave him a credible story and they went so far as to even put a stub for a cinema showing two or three days before this. They put that cinema stub in the pocket of his overcoat so that when the Germans discovered his body and they were wanting to check up his story, that it would all be, uh, appear to be true. And so they took the body, this fictitious Major William Martin, and they put him into the sea just off the coast of Portugal and his body was washed up on the shore. And word of this got to the German embassy in Lisbon and they checked out his story and it all seemed, it all seemed plausible. And here they had the plans had fallen into their hands of the invasion of Greece and it was all a ruse. 
it was all a deception. And the Germans kept many divisions of their armed forces in Greece waiting for this invasion that never came and they weren't prepared fully for the invasion of Sicily. And so that idea, that idea of deception, perhaps it came from the Gibeons and Joshua chapter 9. Perhaps that's where the Allied planners got the idea from. And it worked against the Germans in the same way that the deception of the Gibeonites had worked against the children of Israel. And so what I want to do is from this story is just pick up some lessons that we find on the surface of this story and see if we can learn some lessons for ourselves. And the first lesson I want to think about is this, the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. Our adversary, the devil, is wily and deceitful. We have an adversary who is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He is not all-powerful, not all-knowing. But he does have years of experience. He is very experienced. And as a result, he knows how to deceive us. And the Bible tells us that we have to be very aware of the wiles of the devil. The Gibeonites, when they presented themselves to Joshua, were not who or what they appeared to be. And the Bible makes it clear that the devil, that great adversary of God's people, when he comes to us, he comes with deception. And he is not always who or what he appears to be. And so we need to have discernment. We need to be constantly aware that Satan is our adversary. And he often presents himself in a way to us that is deceptive. Now that is true for overseers in particular. Those who watch over the flock need to have one eye on the flock and one eye on the adversary. And to be aware that when he comes, he comes with deceit, he comes with deception. He comes with a clever ruse to deceive us. And so we read in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 for example. Put on the whole armour of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles means cunning craftiness and subtle trickery. And we haven't travelled too far down the Christian road pathway ourselves, have we, before we learn that that is true. That things that appear to be benign, things that appear to be attractive, things that appear to be okay and no problem, were actually cunning craftiness, subtle trickery by Satan. And we need to keep, what is it we say? We need to keep our wits about us. These devices that the Apostle speaks about in Ephesians chapter 6. We learn about them too in 2 Corinthians 2. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Yeah, the Apostle Paul is talking about exactly the same thing. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, get one over on us to trick us. That word devices means insidious plots, wicked schemes. It actually could be translated in the modern translations, mind games. And that's what Satan plays with us, isn't it? He comes to us and he attacks the mind, he plays mind games with us. Remember that was how he acted right at the very beginning. Remember when he came to Adam and Eve, hath God said? What did he do there? He put doubts in the mind of Adam and Eve. He challenged scripture. He undermined scripture. He challenged 
truth. And he comes with these kind of questions and we end up questioning our salvation. Satan playing subtle, crafty mind games with us. And perhaps it's when we've been watching ministry online or reading books or speaking to other people and subtly and cleverly and craftily Satan comes to us and he deceives us. Puts temptation in our way. Twists scripture. We know that he does that. He offers us attractive alternatives. Remember that was his approach when he came to the Lord in the wilderness. Using scripture. Offering him attractive alternatives. Making them promises. My father used to speak about Satan's tinsel toys. The things that we find very attractive and very alluring. Satan comes and he plays these mind games with us. And so it's important that we protect our mind. And so scripture speaks about putting on the helmet of salvation. Scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Scripture speaks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so we need to keep the mind protected and to be aware of the wiles of the devil. Now, the second lesson that I want to draw our attention to and think about is this. In verse 14, as we were reading, that very early on in this encounter with the Gibeonites, we've got the children of Israel and the princes of the children of Israel and Joshua himself, who should have been on guard. I mean, things had not really gone that well for them. Remember what had just happened to Ai. And they should have been on their guard. And they meet these people... And they hear their story and without too much investigation. It says this, not did they just believe their story, but they took of their victuals. They were more than willing and were acting hastily when they received gifts from these visitors. So not only did they accept them and receive them, but they took from them. And so immediately what had happened, immediately they were compromised. Now I've worked for companies in the past, particularly the German companies actually, and they had what was called a no gifts policy. So whenever you were dealing with external contractors or consultants or advisors, and usually when it came round to about Christmas time, uh, these contractors and consultants were uh, happy and, and, and grateful for the work they had received and so wanted to uh, demonstrate that by providing you with a gift. And of course there would always be an unsaid, an unspoken a kind of message and understanding in this exchange of, of gifts. And so these companies that I worked for had a no gift policy. And it was very wise. You weren't allowed to receive anything and to accept no gifts, not even a calendar at Christmas time. And so you always remained uncompromised in your dealing with that third party business because whether we like it or not and there is usually the intention with the giver behind the gift receiving a gift can change your thinking change your attitude towards the person that has given you the gift and you maybe don't treat them as robustly as you might otherwise have done maybe it's because of the gift you've received or because of the promise of future gifts but it changes your thinking and it compromised them 
and immediately they were in a little way indebted then to the Gibeonites. And that's what Satan does with us as well. That's what our adversary, the devil, does with us as well. He wants to compromise us. That's what he tried to do with the Lord in the wilderness, the temptation in the wilderness. He tries to compromise us and to change our thinking towards us. And even, as it were, make us a little indebted to him. Let's be very careful what we take, what we accept, and who we accept it from. In a practical sense, but even remembering that behind these things, maybe the devil, and he's seeking to compromise us. Maybe it's partaking in something that otherwise we shouldn't or wouldn't. Maybe it's going somewhere. Maybe it's getting involved in a relationship or a business arrangement or any of these kind of things. And Satan offers us what is attractive and sometimes even what is needful. And we find ourselves being compromised. The children of Israel, the princes of the children of Israel, were just a bit too quick to take something from these visitors. And then here is the greatest mistake that they made of all. In verse number 14, what did they not do? Well, they were ready and they were quick to receive the victuals and the gifts. But it says that they asked not counsel of the Lord. They did not seek the Lord's face in the matter. They didn't refer the matter on high. They didn't ask God about this issue. They didn't bring it into the presence of the Lord. They didn't seek his face in the matter. Now we're constantly hearing in the public sector from government that whenever an issue comes up or a problem comes up or something that they've got to face, what does government say they'll do? They'll consult on the matter. And that's very important now. Oftentimes we could be cynical and say that that's an excuse and um, a reason to put off a decision or to blame somebody else. But it's good practice to consult. And in the public sector, it's not a good idea to proceed without consulting. But that's what the children of Israel did here. They proceeded and they were compromised and they did not seek the counsel of the Lord. Psalm 108 says this, they soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. Psalm 106, many times did he deliver them but they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. There in Psalm 106, it's saying that many times the Lord came to their aid and yet they didn't seek the counsel of the Lord. They proceeded on their own counsel. And what happened? They were brought low for their iniquity. Psalm 107 says this, because they rebelled against the words of God and contempted the counsel of the Most High. That seems to be a bit stronger, doesn't it? That not only did they not seek the Lord's counsel, but they went further and they held it in contempt. They didn't want it they probably perhaps knew that the counsel of the Lord would cut across what they wanted to do and so they held it in contempt. Psalm 81, so I gave them up unto their own heart's lust and they walked in their own counsel. Maybe we find the reason in Proverbs chapter number one it says this in verse 25, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and want none of my reproof. That's it, isn't it? 
it cuts across at times what we want to do. We've already set our heart on what we want to do. And we maybe become a little bit afraid that if we go into the word of God and if we get into his presence in prayer, we maybe know what the Lord will say. And he'll tell us not to. And so we don't bother. We proceed on our own counsel. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and want none of my reproof. Better, isn't it, to take it to the Lord? Psalm 20, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. Psalm 33, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Psalm 73, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Proverbs 19, hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in the latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. And here was perhaps the biggest error that the children of Israel made on this occasion, that they didn't seek the face of the Lord in counsel. And so that is a salutary lesson to us, isn't it? That when decisions have to be made, and even perhaps when we suspect that the devil may be behind something, even more important, that we come into the presence of the Lord and we seek his counsel, and we follow and accept his counsel. Now, the next lesson I want to look at is one that we've kind of already thought about um, when we were thinking about them taking the victuals. And that was this. They acted in haste. They acted in haste. It seems like the very day that the Gibeonites presented themselves to Israel, before that day was out, Joshua and the Israelites had made a covenant, made a leak, sworn a promise, a covenant with these people. And it seems very, very quick. I mean, these were strangers and they were in a strange land and they were looking for strangers to drive out of the land. And before the day was out, convinced with this ruse and having received something from these people, Compromised by that, they enter into a deal, enter into about what does scripture tell us to do? It tells us to wait. It doesn't just tell us to wait, it tells us to wait patiently on the Lord. Psalm 27, wait on the Lord, be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say. On the Lord. Psalm 37, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked, wicked devices to pass. Wait on the Lord. Psalm 37, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And so that's an important lesson for us to learn, isn't it? Don't be too hasty. Don't rush into things. I'm getting on about myself in years and my experience, my personal experience, is that we're always better to wait. The best answers to problems, the best answers to solutions, usually come after a period of waiting. And that's the injunction of scripture, isn't it? To wait patiently on the Lord. But here, the children of Israel, they act too quickly, they act with haste. And they give themselves a problem. And so the next mistake that they made was one that, as a result of these things that we've been thinking about, they were forced into. And that was this, verse 15, it says, they let them live. Now, I suppose in modern terms, that sounds like the gracious and good thing to do, the injunction, the instruction that they were to rid the land and they were to drive these people out and they were to destroy them and so on, sounds on the face of it to be quite harsh. But this was a mistake. And the reason it was a mistake was it was against the express instruction of God. 
And yet this kind of compromise, we would maybe think as being a good thing. Compromise is usually seen as a good thing, isn't it? Most problems in life are solved by a compromise, by both sides coming together. But God is not a God of compromise. God had given instruction. Didn't ask them to compromise. And so they made an accommodation with the Gibeonites against the express instruction of God. Now, when we think about that and making compromises, we think about it personally. It's something that as believers we do all the time. And we do it with sin. We make an accommodation and a compromise. Romans 13 says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfil the lust thereof. And yet oftentimes, more often than not, we have come to a compromise and accommodation with sin. We have said about certain sins that we'll let them live. What does scripture tell us to do? Put sin to death, mortify therefore these things. But more often than not, we come to a compromise and accommodation and we say, no, we'll let that live. We'll tolerate it. We'll put up with it. First John 2, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. Now, I'm old enough to remember our brother Jack Hunter, who was in the assembly that I'm in, in Elam Hall in Kilmarnock, and I remember him preaching. He's one of those preachers who left an indelible mark eh, on you. And when he was preaching in 1 John 2, he used to bellow at the top of his lungs, no known sin, no compromise. Mortify Colossians 3, therefore your members which are upon the earth. And John Piper, uh, the American uh, pastor, inspired by Jonathan Edwards, as he is in a lot of his uh, writings and teaching, says this, Killing sin is not optional. This is mortal combat. Sin dies or we die. We must refuse to settle in with sin. So easy, isn't it, just to compromise with sin? And yet God's instruction is clear. Mortify, kill, sin. And so the children of Israel disobeyed the instruction of God, made an accommodation with the Gibeonites and let them live. They had come to a compromise with sin. You come to verse 16 and it says this, three days later. It was only three days before the ruse, the deception of the Gibeonites was uncovered and they were found out. Three short days and yet it was too late. League had been entered into. They had sworn an oath, they had made a promise. And in only three days they had discovered their mistake. That's true in our experience as well, isn't it? We jump into something. We don't seek the face of God in something. We are easily and quickly deceived by Satan. We make a compromise come to an accommodation and usually very, very quickly we learn that it was a mistake and we perhaps come to our senses or it's uncovered and discovered the cost, the price of what we've done is discovered very, very quickly and so it was with Israel and yet they found 
This is an important lesson to learn. They found that although they had very quickly fallen, they had to live with the consequences. And even when they discovered the error and realised their mistake, and it was only three days old, the situation couldn't be reversed. It couldn't be undone. They couldn't wind the clock back. The decision had been made. The promise had been made in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And it was too late. And they had to live with the consequences of their error. That's a salutary lesson for us too. Often we can make a mistake almost on the spur of the moment and in haste and the consequences of that error we may have to live with for the rest of our life. These are serious things, aren't they? That have consequences. That's why it's so important to keep our wits about us, to be wary of the wiles of the devil, to seek the counsel of the Lord, to obey the counsel when it comes to not be compromised. For the last verse that we read, verse 27, after it is detailed that Joshua was so upset and the prince says, what have you done to us? You've tricked us, but the bargain had been struck. And so Joshua says, well, in that case, you're cursed and you will be hewers of wood, drawers of water for us. And it says in verse 27, even unto this day. There had been no end to it. The consequences had passed on down through the generations unto that day. And there is a modern expression that we have for that, isn't, isn't there? Act in haste, repent at leisure. And if we learn anything from this uh, episode in the life of the children of Israel, from Joshua chapter 9, it's that we mustn't act in haste, that we must seek the counsel of the Lord, and that we must have our guard up and our wits about us because of the wiles of the devil. So I thank you for your time. Thank you again for the invitation to bring the word of God to you. I trust that that has been a help and a blessing to you. And I do pray and wish God's blessing upon you now. Thank you.